part two of this tutorial series on why you add non-controlling interests and subtract equity investments when calculating enterprise value. So just to recap a little bit what we did in part one, pretty much everyone agrees you should take a company's equity value and then subtract cash and add debt to calculate enterprise value. But after that, it gets a little bit more controversial. People will do it differently. People will treat items differently. Common scenario is what happens when one company owns a percent of another company. The two most common scenarios there are the company owns under 50%. And in that case, the stake is recorded as an asset on its balance sheet. And then the other scenario, what we're going to focus on here is something called a non-controlling interest, otherwise known as a minority interest. It used to be known as that a long time ago. A lot of people still use the name. This is what happens when the parent company owns over 50%, but less than 100%. In this case, it adds together the items 100%, consolidates the financial statements 100%, and then it records the value of the percent stake that it does not own on the liabilities and equity side of the balance sheet. And the reason you have to think about these items is that equity value is already going to reflect these stakes that you own. And then the second reason is that you need to make an apples to apples comparison with the valuation multiples. The problem is that even if you own some percentage other than 0% or 100%, EBIT, EBITDA, operating income, and so on and so forth are only going to reflect 0%, or 100%, and that's why you need to make this adjustment. So that in enterprise value, you also reflect either 0% of the other company's value or 100% of the other company's value, depending on the scenario that you're in. So we went through this example for equity investments in one of the previous tutorials just before this, but what I wanna focus on here is an example with non-controlling interest. And how this is different is that now, instead of owning 30% of the company, we own 70%. Of the other company and when this happens on the financial statements take a look at this so over here i have our parent company and then i have our majority owned company and then i have our combined company now when you own under 50 percent you really just take the parent company's numbers if you look at these the numbers are exactly the same here down to a certain point for the parent company and the combined company but when you own over 50 percent of another company what you do is you actually add together the items 100 percent so we take our parent company's 400 of revenue and we add our majority owned company's 100 of revenue to get to our combined company's revenue of 500 over here. And the same applies for all the rest of these items, including income taxes. And really it applies all the way until we get down to the net income line. And then we make some adjustments there. And what you do in this scenario is net income, if you look at it, is still really equal to the parent company's net income and then the majority owned company's net income. But then at the bottom of the income statement, you have to make an adjustment and say, you know what? Some of that net income is not really ours because we don't own 100% of this company. We only own 70%. So therefore, we're going to subtract out that 30% we don't get at the bottom of the income statement. And these are just accounting rules under IFRS and US GAAP and probably most other accounting systems in the world. So we take the one minus the 70% ownership over here, we multiply it by the majority owned company's net income, we subtract this two, and we get our net income attributable to parent is what it's usually labeled as in the financial statements of 23 down here. So what problem does this create? Well, in this scenario, what's happening is that equity value by itself is just 320, same as it was before, but it's 390 because we're really implicitly adding the 70% of the ownership times the 100 of the other company. So enterprise value here, as it is right now, reflects 70% of the value of this other company that we own the 70% stake in. What about EBIT and EBITDA, though? Take a look at this. EBITDA. Where is this coming from? Well, operating income here, this reflects 100% of the parent company's operating income and 100% of the majority-owned company's operating income. Same for DNA. It reflects 100% of both of those. So we have a scenario now where EBITDA and EBIT reflect 100%, but enterprise value only reflects 70%, and we get a mismatch of the percentages once again. So at the end of the income statement, as I just showed you before, yes, you do subtract out the 30% the parent company does not own. Problem is, above this, you still have those numbers, and per the rules of accounting, you are not supposed to subtract those out above this. I don't have a good explanation. That's just how it's done. One of the quirks of accounting that you have to get around in these types of analyses. So to fix this, once again, you could say, okay, well, I know what to do. We could just take our EBITDA and our EBIT, and you know what? Let's just subtract that 30% of the other company that we don't own. So we have our EBITDA number over here, and let's take our, I'm going to use a subtraction sign and then say one minus 
this 70% to keep it flexible. And then, okay, so we have the 30% that we don't own. That is the one minus F106 there. And then let's go over to this majority owned company and let's take their operating income plus their DNA, so their EBITDA. So look at this, we have our 30% we don't own times the other company's EBITDA over here. So you could do that. And now you get to EBITDA of 74 and the EV to EBITDA multiple also falls as well. So you could attempt to do something like that. But the problem once again is that in real life, this just doesn't work because the parent company doesn't disclose enough information. Now over here, the way I set this up, as I showed you the parent company's income statement and the majority owned company's income statement. In real life, you are only going to get the consolidated income statement. So you're only going to get this you're not going to get the majority owned companies underlying income statement. Companies just don't disclose that in their filings. Or if they do, they certainly don't do it for all companies that are like this. They like to disclose as little information as possible in most cases. So that's why, as I say here, it's not viable to subtract out 30% of the majority owned companies, EBIT, EBITDA, and so on, because you just don't have this underlying information for real companies. All you have is this. You could attempt to work backwards. You know the other companies' net income, but how do you go from net income to operating income and DNA? Very difficult to guess what those numbers are just based on the other company's net income. So it's just not viable to do this. So the better solution is to add the percent that the parent company does not own times the value of that other company in the enterprise value calculation. And I'm just gonna go and fix our EBITDA formula over there. So here's what you do in this case. You have another line item called non-controlling interest. And this will be shown on the company's balance sheet, by the way. So it's pretty easy. You just go in the balance sheet and get it there. But in this example, I'm going to show you how you might actually calculate it if you didn't have that. And you can just take the value of the other company times one minus how much they own in the other company. So this will come out to 30%. And then for the enterprise value calculation, you simply add that. And that represents the percent they don't own and that gives you your enterprise value. So what have we done now? Well, if you think about it, this equity value here, 390, this is really 320 plus the 70% times the 100, that gets us to the 390. Then to get us to 100%, we have to add in the 30% that we don't own times the 100, and that gets us to our enterprise value of 570 here. These multiples change accordingly because now what was going on is we have 100% of both companies operating income and DNA or just operating income for EBIT. And in enterprise value, we also have 100%. So take a look at the comparison here. With the first example, we left out this value entirely. So the enterprise value is 470. Why? Because the value of the other company is 100. We don't have anything of the other company here. So that's why this is 470. In this example, though, we have 100% of the value of the other company. And that's why enterprise value here is 570 instead. So that's how you do this here. And that's really the most elegant solution because again, in real life, this whole business with trying to adjust the majority owned company's EBITDA, EBIT, et cetera, just doesn't work. You will not be able to find this information in 99% of companies' financial statements. So that's why you do it like this. And that is why you add non-controlling interests and subtract equity investments when calculating enterprise value. So just a quick recap and summary here. The key concept is that you have to make an apples to apples comparison all the time. Equity value is always going to reflect the percent that the parent company actually owns in other companies. So if you own 70%, equity value reflects 70% times 100 or whatever it is. If you own 30% and the other company is worth 200, equity value is going to reflect that 30% times the 200 or 60. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just the way it works. Investors buy and sell shares based on this with this knowledge. The problem is with the accounting rules. The company cannot actually show 70% or 30% on their entire income statement on all the items. Instead, what they do is they take an all or nothing approach. You have to either show 100% of the other company's numbers if you own over 50% or you have to show 0% if you own under 50% and then make an adjustment at the bottom of the income statement. So we have these adjustments here that we saw for net income attributable to non-controlling interests. We saw how in the other example, we had equity investment earnings or equity investment net income, whatever you want to call it. So we adjust at the bottom of the income statement, but that's all we do. And that creates problems for these valuation multiples because with enterprise value, if we calculate it as is, it's going to show the 70% or 30%, but the EBIT or EBITDA are only going to show us the 0% or the 100%. It's not really possible to adjust EBIT or EBITDA in most cases because we don't have the, other, the information to do so, 
but it is possible to adjust, adjust enterprise value by subtracting equity investments and adding non-controlling interest. And so that is the approach you take. And that's why you add non-controlling interest and subtract equity investments in this calculation, assuming that you're using enterprise value for purposes of calculating valuation multiples, which you pretty much always are.